And while on the surface, it looks like we're an organization that just delivers websites, the truth is the real service we provide to our clients is much bigger than that. It's a chance to facilitate this organizational change. And we do that by providing a great client experience, not just a great website. But no matter how hard my team works to create this great client experience, there are pieces of that experience that are just out of our control. Let me explain. When a client requests a website, they have no idea what goes into making that happen. Although my team controls the building blocks that go into creating their site, modules, themes, libraries, other teams around the university control the servers, vanity hosts, work group administration, web authentication, file storage, video conferencing, ordering and billing, service catalog pages, just to name a few. The truth is our customers' end-to-end -end experience was a disconnected, duct-taped set of services, much bigger than just our team, and to a great extent, out of our team's control. What would it be like to be the person that has to think about how all of this works together? How all of it adds up to create our customer's experience? Now that's the kind of problem I want to be solving. But honestly, I have no idea how to even start trying to do that. Is it even possible? So I keep on pushing pixels, another day, another wireframe, another bug fix, Day after day, more buttons, margins, debugging, more bootstrap overrides. And every day, that nagging feeling in the back of my mind grows stronger. <clears throat> that there's got to be a way to work on the bigger picture, a way to design experience beyond the screen. One day, my colleague sends me a link to an article on a topic I'd never heard about before. Service, design. <laughs> like having a light going off in a dark room this idea of service design began to illuminate the possibilities of designing beyond the screen. Before this, I had no idea there was even a service design discipline, that there were people whose job title was service designer. This seemed like exactly what I was looking for, but what does a service designer actually do day to day, and how do I become one? How do I find all the service designers and figure out if this is the answer to all my hopes and dreams? And how do I figure out how to do this at an organization that doesn't even know what service design is yet. One day, as I'm scouring the Adaptive Path website, like one does, I come across an announcement for the 2014 Service Experience Conference. This is it. This is my chance to meet real live service designers and get all my questions answered. So I put together a plan. I got my boss to pay for a ticket. I resolved to connect with whoever I could find. And so a year ago today, I was like you, or the people at the conference, sitting in the audience, getting inspired, listening to stories about the Olympics, food delivery, hospital experiences, retail, even space aliens, and my brain was swimming with ideas. I was taking notes furiously, thinking of all the ways I was gonna take what I heard and bring it back to my office, like I found some sort of Rosetta Stone of service design. I'd taken it all in, bought into every word. This service design thing seemed like the real deal. But the more I learned, the more questions I had. Hearing the stories of real life service designers was inspiring, but it still wasn't clear to me how I could become a service designer, what it looked like day to day. If you were gonna walk into your job tomorrow and say, I'm a service designer now, what would your calendar look like for the next week? I sure didn't. So after the excitement of the conference, the exhaustion and exhilaration, I found myself back at my desk trying to figure out how I could apply service design to my job in between designing websites. Shouldn't I just be able to take the heart of design principles and map it to these larger service experiences? It seems simple, but I just couldn't wrap my head around how to scale up my design toolkit, how, to, how my abstract principles translated to a practical application in a larger business context. A wireframe can't paint the picture of an experience over time. A task flow can't capture the incredible complexity of a service ecosystem. I needed new tools, new methods, a new mindset to approach these bigger problems. So ignoring my pixel pushing to-do list, I started researching everything I could on service design. I bought books, I watched videos, I read articles, I reached out to people I'd seen talk at the conference, 
I even started a Stanford community of practice around service design. So the few of us who had drunk the Kool-Aid could get together and conspire on how to bring it to the rest of campus. I started talking to everyone I could find about service design and what it could do in the hopes that talking about it would make it real. In my fervor, I even submitted a talk proposal to a national web design and development conference, a talk in which I planned to show the gospel on why the web community needed to consider a service design approach, because I was starting to believe that service design was the answer to all industries, the secret <laughs> to bringing design thinking into business process, and more intentionally designing the bigger picture experience for our customers. By this point, my team is starting to wonder about me. So Megan, this service design thing seems pretty interesting, but uh, what does it all mean? It's the answer, I would say. It lets you look at your customer's experience of your service holistically. It lets you design the bigger picture end to end. But when you're a web designer in a single team, in a chain of loosely connected service and product teams, how can you even hope to design the bigger picture? There's a point at which you have to start to show and not tell in order to get these kind of concepts across. I had to find a way to start applying this back to my job. I had to figure out how to do service design. I took my dilemma to the whiteboard, sketching furiously all the ideas flying around in my brain, and suddenly I had a moment of clarity. I needed to stop learning about service design. I needed to stop talking about service design. <laughs> All I needed to do was just decide to do service design. Was it really that simple? <laughs> so the next day, I set everything aside and I said to myself, this is it. Today I'm going to do service design. I set aside the comfortable work, the work I knew, and I tried to apply service design principles to the context of my job. At the time, it felt like a grand experiment, a side project, playing hooky even. But the reality of it was, that was the day I became a service designer, even though I didn't know it yet. Instead of thinking about user experience, instead of thinking about the scope of the work I was responsible for, the part of our service that I touch, I pretended to be responsible for our entire service. I pretended that my new domain was anything and everything having to do with our service offering. So what would I do if my domain was this bigger picture? I imagined myself in a hot air balloon, rising out of my little work group up into the air. From this viewpoint, I could see how things fit together or didn't. And I started making lists, lists of touch points of people, systems, tools, interactions, everything I could come up with that had anything to do with our service. And I started drowning in a sea of information. Who knew there was so much involved with delivering websites to campus? I tried to connect the dots, to map it all back to our major customer scenarios, back to the biggest pain points of our service, so that I could make some sense of it all. I didn't know what I was trying to do specifically, just that I was trying desperately to understand all the aspects of our service, as if it were some key to unlocking a hidden treasure. And the further I went, the more I realized I had no idea what I was doing. It was incredibly uncomfortable to be so out of my normal context. But at the same time, it energized me. And it forced me to collaborate with my team in an entirely new way. As I started drafting these artifacts representing our service, I noticed that everyone on my team started paying attention. This was new territory. And it amazed me, but probably shouldn't have surprised me, that no one seemed to understand the complete picture of our service. This was the first time that any of us had tried to illustrate the totality of the experience that we created. My ultimate goal was to create a service blueprint for our most critical scenario. From my understanding, Service blueprinting would help me clearly see and understand the mechanics that go into creating a complex service experience. This could be a tool to help me paint this holistic picture, share it with others, get alignment, uncover opportunities to design in the gaps. I had to figure this thing out. Now, I'd looked long and hard at a lot of blueprinting examples I could find, and to be honest, 
I was really struggling with figuring out how to make one, and even more confused about what to do with it once I had made one. Nowhere could I find a real practical approach to service blueprinting that would help me how to use this tool. God, I was so frustrated. Even though I put in all this work, wrapping my head around the larger service experience and had this like, huge mess of information, I still couldn't figure out what to do with it all, how to make it meaningful for my team. Blueprinting seemed like this elusive white whale, this magic golden ticket to the kingdom of service design. I had to learn more. How exactly do you make a service blueprint, and what do you do with it once you've got one? In a moment of desperation, I admitted, it was no use going through slideshare after slideshare any longer. I needed an insider's knowledge. I needed to hear what it was like to service design in the trenches, pick someone's brain on this blueprinting thing. I needed to find a mentor. Actually, I needed a Yoda, someone who could give me the training I needed, who could empathize with me on my journey to service design. Maybe someone in a similar boat who was trying to bring service design into a large, complex, technology-focused organization. So I reached out to one of the speakers I had seen at the conference, who seemed to be in a similar situation to me, a guy named Eric Flowers. He works at Intuit doing service design and has had a lot of success getting people to buy into service design through blueprinting. <clears throat> so we set up a meeting, and honestly, I went in expecting to get some one-time advice on blueprinting, a friendly LinkedIn connection, maybe some templates if I was lucky. And instead, I found a thought partner. Eric, like me, was obsessed with developing tools, methods, frameworks. We both really wanted to understand the principles of what we were doing and figure out how to make them practical and apply them directly back to our jobs. But how do you apply something new to your job when your day-to-day -day only affords you so many opportunities to practice? We were already reading all the books, trying to find trainings, workshops to grow our knowledge, but opportunities were few and far between. We realized we had to take this on, on the side, as hobbyists. So instead of trailblazing along on our own, we decided to trailblaze along together. We set up standing Wednesday night hangouts, in-person design-a-thons, and a swath of post-its and Google Docs that look like a Lego city hit by Godzilla. <laughs> we would literally take time away from our science fiction TV shows to get together no. and workshop methodologies of service design. No. No kidding. <laughs> we wanted to advance this body of knowledge for no other reason than our passion and our commitment to developing our craft and the potential to give back. With this new partnership underway and coaching from Eric, I finally completed my first service blueprint using a new methodology we've been developing that helps you focus on the end-to-end, surface-to-core understanding. This blueprint was a big hit, and we used it to generate actionable insights, ideas that turned into JIRA tickets in our backlog and service roadmap planning. And I started noticing that some of the other deliverables I had made were starting to show up in my teammates' slideshows and in their conversations with clients. I realized that service design as a process wasn't just about learning new tools or methods. It was about facilitating a mind shift, and not just for myself, but for my team as well. And as our eyes were opened to this bigger picture of our service experience, we were able to make new connections, see things in a different context, and change the conversation we were having about our service. This was all very exciting. <laughs> I felt like I was finally getting somewhere, finally figuring out what it meant to be doing service design. And of course, at this moment, when I was thinking service design all day long and in my sleep, reality hit me. A month into my service design side project, I once again stared at my client project list with a sinking heart. Not because the work wasn't important, but because I had leveled up to something bigger and there was no going back. The work I had done had shifted my perspective and changed the way I saw the world. And I realized in a moment of gut-wrenching fear that it was time to face the inevitable. It was time to let go of my identity as a web designer. All those years of developing my craft, my portfolio of work, all my design books, although they were critical in my development as a designer, I had to admit to myself it was time to move on. How would I find an opportunity for myself to grow 
in a context that would support the work I wanted to do. One afternoon, I hear a knock at the door. I look up, and one of our senior leaders is standing in the doorway. I'm a little thrown, not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing. What do I even say to this person? Do they even know who I am? Are they even in the right office? The first thing out of his mouth is, so, I hear you have a person to talk to about service design. My heart jumps in my throat. Holy crap, it's happening. <laughs> We start to have a conversation, and I explain the elevator pitch, the value proposition of service design and what it can do for an organization. He seems more than interested. And what happened next is what every passionate person dreams about and dreads. He asked me, so what would you do to bring service design to all of university IT? I stared up at the figure shadowing my doorway. My heart was beating loudly in my ears. There's no escaping this conversation. No other way besides the door to escape the room. I gripped the edges of my chair. I had to think fast. No time for slides, notes, preparation. I had to just face this moment. And there are times in life when you just have to trust yourself and speak your truth. So I looked him right in the eye and I said with confidence, let me tell you what I would do. And as I talked, I realized I knew exactly what I would do and that I did have a vision for service design for all of University IT. And I also realized with every nod of his head that this senior leader was becoming more and more convinced of this vision I had formed in my spare time between client engagements, product UX, and pixel vision. This wasn't just a dream anymore. If my leadership were interested, then maybe it could become a reality. And so I decided to try and make it real. Instead of daydreaming, I started to share my dream with others. And as I spread the word, I discovered a network of allies, people who I could bounce ideas off of, count on to support me, and help build momentum around my vision. <clears throat> this network connected me to the leaders, instigators, and change makers around my organization. And as the conversation progressed, I found a sense of clarity I was able to really start articulating my ideas, figuring out how service design would fit in University IT in a way that was something I couldn't ever take out of a book. I realized I needed to create a new role for myself, literally create a new job and get someone to hire me to do that job. I had to get positioned organizationally so I could do the work I wanted to do and make the impact I wanted to make. I had to paint this picture of the future and how this new role would benefit University IT and Stanford as a whole. So I wrote proposals, roadmaps, job descriptions, I created objectives, I gave people concrete options to respond to, all the while building my confidence, putting myself out there. I dove in with gusto, painting this picture of the future I wanted to see, and sharing that vision with the people who could make it happen. And with the help of my community, all my research, my side projects, testing my ideas, I was able to make space for my dream to become a reality. Evangelizing service experience, inspiring others, making the future. This was the work I wanted to be doing. And when six months after that knock at my door, I held in my hand an offer letter for senior service designer, it was sure time to celebrate. Only a year ago, I was sitting in the audience of the service experience conference dreaming about becoming a service designer. Now I get to help define what service design means for all of university IT. And better yet, I have a service design team to do it with. And I'm ready for the challenge, ready to test out new ideas, to connect to more people, all of you, <laughs> and continue to share my vision for seamless and quality customer experience. It's an exciting new frontier, and I have no idea what to expect. I'm starting a job that's never been done before. Where do I even start? So now that you're caught up, we can start the talk. <laughs> Hi, my name is Megan Miller. I'm a service designer for Stanford University IT. So picture this, it's my first day. I'm sitting at the end of a giant conference room table. Three video conferencing screens are pointed at me and 15 people are staring at the new girl. The project lead turns to me and asks, after an awkward silence, 
So Megan, tell us what you'll be doing in your new role. 